Yeah, well, um, so uh, there's basically three things I want to talk about today. One is going to probably take most of the time. Uh, I mean, I guess I would just say it's like Locke's ethics as as developed in this book. Um, so you know his um, his main political work, the two treatises on government, um, obviously also has something to say about these same topics. It's not always clear that actually they're consistent with each other, even though they were published around the same time. It's kind of weird. I'm not sure exactly what's going on there, but anyway, um, but I'm be talking about the way he does it in this book. And then uh, when I teach Bill 144, I talk about the way he does it, does it in the other book. <laughs> All right, anyway, um, so, so this means like freedom of the will, Um, moral, moral relations, and personal identity. Um, and the reason personal identity fits in here is because we'll remember last time towards the end I was I was. I left it open. What is going to be the criterion for trying to figure out whether something at one time is the same person with something at another time? And basically, the answer is going to be that um, Y at this time is the same person as X at this time if Y is responsible for X's actions. Or as Locke puts it, person um, uh, person is a forensic concept. Um, okay. Um, and then I I want to I hope I'll have some time to talk about these other classifications or properties of ideas that he discusses late in book two. Especially adequate versus inadequate. Um, so maybe distinct versus confused. And then finally, although I know I always run out of time and don't get to say much about it, is what Locke calls madness <laughs> the association of ideas. Um, all right, so I'm just going to start right on this. Um, okay, so first of all, um, freedom of the will. Um, freedom or liberty, I think Locke uses these two terms interchangeably, um, is Locke says is a power. He defines it as a kind of power. What power is it? Well, it's the power to do or refrain from doing something depending on your will. Right? So, like, um, if I'm standing here and I can um, start walking if I prefer to start walking or stay here if I prefer to stay here, then I'm free to walk or not to walk. Um, you, you, need, you need both of those parts, right? Like if you're only, if you're like, if, uh, to use an example that Locke keeps using, if you're falling off a cliff, then 
Uh, if you prefer to keep falling, you can keep falling. <laughs> but if you prefer to not keep falling, you'll still keep falling. And <laughs> so you're not free to fall or not fall. Right? Like you always have to you always have to have both of them. Um, so anyway, so that's what liberty is. It's the like depending on preference. And so when Locke discusses the question of the of freedom of the will, the first thing he says is, well, um, this isn't the kind of thing, uh, or sorry, I shouldn't say that. I guess I should say one other thing, what is the will? The will is basically the power to prefer something. So, uh, um, so Locke says, this isn't the kind of thing that could be free. This is a power. This is another power. The powers don't have powers. Substances have powers. Right, so he says, this is uh, book two, chapter 21, section 14 on page two. 25. Um, it is as insignificant to ask whether man's will be free as to ask whether his sleep be swift or his virtue square. Liberty being as little applicable to the will as swiftness of motion is to sleep. <laughs> Right, it's just not the kind of thing, the will, which is the power to prefer something, is not the kind of thing that can have the power to do or not do something according to a preference. What can have this power? A, a person, right? Like a human being can have that power. And the same human being can have this power. But one power can't have the other. Another way he tries to explain is he says, well, it's not like the power to sing you can't, it doesn't make sense to ask whether the power to sing has the power to dance. <laughs> the person who has the power to sing can have the power to dance. But the power to sing can't have other powers. All right. So, um, so I mean, this is a good point, sort of, but it's not exactly relevant. I mean, because what it really shows is just that we're putting the question the wrong way. Um, right, that is we didn't ask, when we asked, is the will free? We didn't ask the question we meant to ask. Because obviously we weren't trying to ask whether this power has another power. There was something else we wanted to know. Um, and I mean, I think Locke starts this way partly because, uh, well, let me say what the question, what the what the other question he goes on to answer is. So he says, you know, um, well, no. I mean, okay, yeah, put it this way. So will is a power. It doesn't make sense to ask whether will has powers. But um, the act of willing or volition is not a power. It's an act. It's an operation. Right? Now, I mean, it doesn't make sense to ask whether an operation has a power or not, according to lie. But it does make sense to ask whether we have the power to do or not do that action depending on our preference. Right? Like so for example, if I if I said is the power to sing free, 
Locke would say, well, no, the power to sing can't have a power. And freedom is a power. But probably what I really wanted to ask was, can I sing or not sing depending on my preference? Right, that is, is the power to sing the power to do an action which I'm free to do. And I mean, I think uh, and Locke knows perfectly well, he even says at some point, you know, this I think is what people usually have in mind when they ask whether the will is free, right? He knows that no one meant to ask this question, right? This is just like correcting their grammar basically, right? He knows no one meant to ask this question, and he goes on to answer the other question. But the answer to the other question is no. <laughs> right? And I think that's why he starts with this. Because <laughs> like, it sounds like he's just throwing out the question as a bad question. Um, but, if you, but if you pay attention, you'll realize that he actually is answering the question that people meant to ask when they asked whether we have freedom of the will. And his answer is no, we don't have to be. Um, um, the truth is, uh, it became after Locke, well, quite a bit after Locke, I guess. The 19th century, at some point, it became pretty well, I should say, no, hardly. Yeah, even in Locke's time, there were there were empiricist philosophers who were perfectly happy to say straight out that well, you know, we don't have freedom of will. Um, but still, I think it's pretty controversial, and also that maybe. I guess, you know, there's there's two reasons to be careful about saying something, if at least two reasons to be careful about saying something, um, especially when you get into these areas that have to do with, with like people's real actions, right? One reason is that you're worried that you'll say something unpopular and you'll get in trouble. But another reason is you're worried you say something dangerous and you'll get your readers into trouble because they won't know how to, to deal with it, right? And I think in this case, it's probably, if something like this is going on, that it's probably more the latter, right? Locke is worried that some readers uh, will become fatalists if they're convinced that there's no freedom of the world. Um, all right, in any case, so, that, so he starts with that kind of confusing Thing about the question being wrong, but then he goes on to discuss the actual question. So, um, so, and he discusses it in two different ways, which also could be confusing. So, the first one is the first question he asks is, um, Are we free to will or not will anyway? Right? Like, in other words, is volition like, um, generally speaking, in the abstract, something we're free to do or not do? Right, so like, so, so like, uh, um, if I'm, let's say I'm standing here and, I'm, and I could stay here or I could walk, am I free to either choose one of those or not will any? That's the question, right? So if I choose either of those, then I'm willing something. But if I, but if I, but the question is, can I choose between, and choose means, will it depend on my preference? 
whether I will something or will nothing at all. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, this is uh, still probably not the question people are usually asking when they ask about freedom of the will. Um, but it is an interesting question. I mean, I think that uh, Locke has in mind, especially Descartes and also the Stoics who Descartes follows on this, um, right? Like a big part of Descartes' philosophy is um, the importance of suspending the will when you don't have sufficient grounds to determine it one way or the other. And like that's how, I mean, because uh, Descartes understands error as resulting from um, um, our freedom to judge, even though we don't have rational grounds to base our judgment. Um, that's the ex that's the general explanation of error in the fourth meditation. Right, and so the, the prescription to avoid error is whenever you're not rationally compelled one way or the other, you should suspend judgment. And from and from Descartes' point of view, suspending judgment means suspending the will, like um, deliberately not either judging or not judging. That is, I mean, that is Descartes thinks of judgment as an act of the will. Okay, so I mean, so Locke is taking on this question and saying that no, that's impossible. You can't suspend the will. The proof of this is a little bit weird. Um, the proof is this is what he discusses in book two, chapter 21, section 23. Page 229. Um, the reason whereof is very manifest, for it being unavoidable that the action depending on his will should exist or not exist, and its existence or not existence following perfectly the determination and preference of his will, he cannot avoid willing the existence or not existence of that action, right? So the point is like, by the law of excluded middle, um, I have to either walk or not walk. And then the idea is, but he's like, he splits in something much stronger into the definition of will. Like, remember our definition of, of uh, Freedom, I guess. So remember the definition of freedom was that um, I can walk or not walk depending on my preference. But now he's understanding to mean that um, I will walk or not walk if and only if I prefer. Right? So like that is the first way was if I prefer to walk, I'll walk. And if I prefer not to walk, I won't walk. But now he's saying that um, the existence or non-existence of the action um, follows perfectly the determination and preference of the will. And he's taking that to mean that I'll, I'll walk if and only if I prefer to walk, and I won't walk if and only if I prefer not to walk. So, like, I mean, it's true, it's like logically true that if there really is um, uh, like, so here's walk, and here's not walk. And we're saying, uh oh, walk and will start with the same letter. All right. <laughs> and we're saying that. I'll walk like if and only if I prefer to walk. And I'll not walk if and only if I prefer 
not one. Well, so since by the law of excluded middle, one of these has to be true. Therefore, it's just a matter of logic that one of these has to be true. But the question is, are the states of preferring to walk and preferring not to walk really equivalent to, right? Like, that, that is, the question is about these logical equivalences. And even if I'm free to walk or not to walk by his original definition, this, this is saying much stronger, right? So like, it's true that if I, if I have some states that are equivalent to contradictory opposites, then one of them has to be true. But the question is whether I really have such states. All right, anyway, uh, so like, I'm not sure he's really got uh, a great answer to Descartes there. Um, but like I said, anyway, this is less interesting because this isn't really the question that people are mostly asking when they ask about freedom of the will. What they're mostly asking is, um, are we free? <laughs> right. Are we free to choose which alternative you'll prefer? Right, so remember, like freedom means that whether I do it or not do it is gonna depend on what I prefer. But now you can ask the same, you can ask the question about preference itself. Can I prefer or not prefer depending on which one I prefer? <laughs> now, um, Locke deals with this one also pretty quickly, right? So the answer here is no. The answer here again is no. So, I mean, first of all, I think it's clear that this is much closer to what people are actually asking when we have freedom of the will, right? They're saying, um, um, sure, I understand whether I walk or not depends on what I prefer. But if what I prefer depends on something else that's out of my control, then I'm not really free to walk or not. Right, like that pre preference is determined by something else. Um, by my own previous states, but ultimately by things that have nothing to do with me. Um, I guess, I mean, unless you're alive. <laughs> right, so, um, um, so what we want, when we're asking whether the will is free, we're saying like, oh, so can I get, Back of that preference and, and control that too. Um, at least that's one thing people may be asking of the questions Locke discusses. This is one that, that's that's actually something people are sometimes asking when they ask whether the will is free. And like I said, his answer is no. And basically, he says it's a silly question. Um, This is book two, chapter 21, section 25 on page 230. I feel like, I feel like kind of like buying some kind of podium thing, just like bringing it in. <laughs> I understand why this is one here. All right, anyway. Um, uh, for to ask whether a man be at liberty to will either motion or rest, speaking or silence, which he pleases, is to ask whether a man can will what he wills, or be pleased with what he is pleased with, a question which I think needs no answer. And they who can make a question of it must suppose one will to determine the acts of another, and another to determine that, and so on in infinitum. Right? So this he's saying this is an infinite regress. Now, I mean, I guess there's it would be an infinite regress if the answer were yes, always. 
Um, but again, I think that's what people want, right? Like, I mean, so, I mean, because the truth is, and I'm sure Locke wouldn't deny this, like sometimes we can like form preferences about what preferences we wish we had and do things to try to influence that, right? But, um, but uh, I think Locke would say, well, okay, but that, you know, but you can't like, then also determine that preference and that one and that one and that one. That would be an infinite recess. Um, and yet, if you stop anywhere, you still have the same complaint, right? That, right? So let's say, you know, let's say yesterday I was like, wow, it will really be better tomorrow if I prefer to walk rather than stand still. So I'm gonna like psych myself up or like, I don't know, whatever things you could do to try to affect your preferences tomorrow. <laughs> so, you know, um, but then uh, that that doesn't really make what I do tomorrow any freer, right? Because still I have to ask, well, what determined my preference yesterday? And if that was, again, was something outside of my control, then I'm still not free by this strict scheme of what people are asking. Um, and there can't be an infinite regress because, so he doesn't say, right? Yeah, I mean, you always have to ask this, and often, but often it's difficult to answer. When a philosopher says, but that would be an infinite regress, you have to say, well, wait, maybe an infinite regress is okay. <laughs> I think. Um, Locke thinks that an infinite regress is impossible here because Locke thinks, and this is the way most, not completely all maybe, but this is, this is the way most philosophers think about infinity in this period and even a lot after it, that an infinite uh, series is a series that doesn't come to an end. Right? Like that's the definition of it. Doesn't come to an end. So if they really required an infinite number of acts of will in order to act, I would I would never be able to act. I think that's why he thinks this is absurd. Um, it's interesting to ask, like, how top solution is supposed to avoid this problem, but obviously I won't talk about that. All right. Um, so, uh, but so, okay, so this is the answer. We don't have free will. All right. So, but then Locke says, oh, but you still might have a question here. What, what does determine the if it's not, so it's not my preference, but I have the power, the will is the power to choose either alternative, right? It's the power to prefer. Um, what determines, like, which way it goes, right? Like, the will is the power to prefer to walk, and it's the power to prefer to stand still. Um, what determines which of those operations will actually happen? Um, and um, the answer is basically pleasure and pain. Pain or uneasiness or this ease of concepts. Um, um, the will is determined. I think uh, this was something he added in later editions, but he, he, I mean, what he eventually decided is it basically works like this. The will is determined not to act by pleasure, and it's determined to act by pain. Right? So as if things are good, then I prefer not to do anything. But if things are bad, then I prefer to do something because I want to get rid of 
whatever is causing you that pain or uh, dis-ease, right? So then he says that, that, that what we call desire always involves uh, uneasiness, right? It means that if I say I desire X, it means not just that having X would be pleasant, but that not having it now is unpleasant. And if you only had the first, then it wouldn't move me to act. Now, I mean, I don't know. I guess he goes on a lot about that. I think because he changed his mind about it. I'm not sure how much difference it makes. The main point is that um, um, uh, we always. Our will is, remember he said this already in book one, our will is constantly under this influence. It steadily acts throughout our whole life from the moment we're born, right? It's, he says it's like, in that sense, you could say there is an innate practical principle. And the principle is seek pleasure and avoid pain. Um, So, so far, this is what's called um, what's called psychological hedonism. Right? That is as opposed to ethical hedonism. So, right, ethical hedonism is the doctrine that um, um, the right thing to do is to gain pleasure and avoid pain. Psychological hedonism is the claim that, and I mean, this terminology is, I don't even know where this terminology comes from, which means probably I shouldn't use it, but <laughs> it's, it's widespread now, but I don't know exactly where it comes from. It's not like Locke's terminology or anything, but psychological hedonism means, just means that as a matter of fact, we always seek pleasure and avoid pain. Now, I mean, this, you know, it's not as simple a thing as you might at first think, because at least as Locke understands it, um, it's, um, it doesn't refer just to the present moment. In principle, and this is going to be what's so important about the theory of uh, personal identity, or it's going to be the foundation of it. That in principle, what I want is not just pleasure or and no pain for myself now, but like in the long term, I want pleasure for myself, and I don't want pain for myself. Um. So, like, that means that, um, like, how this principle operates on me is going to, like, depend on, number one, how accurate my prediction of the future is, right? Like, I mean, I can, I can be wrong about what is going to cause me pain or pleasure in the future. Um, I mean, that much, I guess, is... is is obvious, but um, but also um, this uh, I don't know a place in this book where Locke says this really explicitly, but it seems it's implied in everything he says about this that like it's um, it can be hard to focus on the long run. It can be hard to pay attention to things that are going to happen far in the future. Or, even if I know or believe that they're going to happen, I can get distracted, right? And it, I mean, like any, I think any type of plausible theory of psychological hedonism, um, at least, I guess, unless we really think it's about pain and pleasure in the moment, has to add something like this, that like, right? So, um, uh, 
you know, uh, suppose that uh, I think it's going to be really pleasurable to get drunk now, but I know it's going to make me really sick tomorrow morning. So, uh, so, and I, I'm not making that kind of error that I first talked about, right? Like I know it's going to make me sick tomorrow. Morning. And if I really paid attention to that, I would, th this is how the psychological hedonist has to explain what happens next, right? If I really paid attention to that, I would definitely not get drunk now because whatever pleasure I'm going to get out of it is outweighed by the pain I'm going to have tomorrow. But, you know, it's like easy to get distracted by what's going on now and not pay so much attention to what's going to happen tomorrow. Um, and like, of course, even more so, it's easy to get distracted by what happens in this life and not pay attention to what's going to happen in the afterlife, <laughs> right? So, um, um, okay, so so that's the that's psychological hedonism. Now, like I said, so far this is not an ethical theory. It just it's just a way of describing how it is, what it is that actually makes people prefer one thing rather than another. It's, it's not their own preference. That would be an infinite regress. It must be something else. And the answer is, it's this. It's this calculation of um, about pleasure and pain. Um, so it's not an ethical theory, but it drives the fundamental part of Locke's ethical theory. And this is in book two, chapter 28. I mean, book two, chapter 28, which is called Of Other Relations, is where the main part of his ethics is. Um, so this is um, um, book two, chapter 28, section six on page 316. Um, good and evil, as hath been shown, are nothing but pleasure and pain. So that, right, so, so this is about the meaning of good and evil generally. Nothing but pleasure and pain. Or that which occasions or procures pleasure or pain to us. Right? That is, what we mean by good is either what's directly pleasurable or what procures pleasure for us. So it's useful for getting pleasure. These are the two kinds of two mean, general meanings of the word good. So when I say, like, um, grapes are good, I mean grapes uh, bring me pleasure, either directly or because I can use them to get pleasure. So if you say grapes are not good, you mean um, grapes don't bring you pleasure. So we're not even, we're not really disagreeing. This is the general meaning of the word good. I mean, so so far, this is no good. This no good. This this kind of good is not going to work as a basis for morality. Um, so that's why he goes on to define morally good and evil. Morally good and evil, then. Is only the conformity or disagreement of our voluntary actions to some law, whereby good or evil is drawn on us from the will and power of the lawmaker. Which good and evil, pleasure or pain, attending our observance or breach of the law by the decree of the lawmaker, is that we call reward and punishment. So, Morally good means um, uh, 
pending to that remains. Pleasure by will of the lawmaker. I mean, I, I've shortened the definition a little bit. I, it's, I mean, I, I should read what it actually says. Um, conformity or disagreement of our voluntary actions to some law, whereby good or evil is drawn on us from the will and power of the lawmaker. So it's, right, the point is that there has to be a law and my voluntary action has to conform or not conform to the law. And because my voluntary action conforms or doesn't conform to the law, the, um, um, the law maker has the will and power um, that is will and can supply me with pleasure, pleasure or pain, respectively. Which, as he says, is what we call reward or punishment. Right? So, like, if I say that action is morally good, I mean, it's inconformable with some law, and the whoever made the law has willed that actions that conform to that law will be rewarded, and whoever made that law has the power to reward them, so, so they will. Right, so that's it's a kind of good. It's actually this kind of good. Right, it means that action is useful because it's a way of procuring pleasure for myself. I can procure pleasure for myself by doing the action that conforms to the law, and I know that the lawmaker can and will reward me. Um. So, as I said, this discussion of morality falls in the chapter called Other Relations. Of other relations. Why? Because, as it's clear from this definition, Locke is a moral relevance. What is it? What is a relativist? You know, so. Like, remember, uh, last time I was discussing the difference between absolute and relative ideas or words or predicates, whatever. Well, you know, um, uh, some relative terms or ideas are like obviously relative. Right? Like, like, um, bigger was one of the examples I was talking about last time. Right, so it's clear that if I say this book is bigger, I'm not done. Right, it's like bigger than what? <laughs> I mean, sometimes in context it may be clear, and I can leave it up. Like we were just talking about, oh, this is a big book, and I say, well, this book is bigger. Right, but like uh, if it's not clear from context, then you then then you're gonna have to ask me what it was relative to. But some words are um, seem like they're absolute or positive, but when you think about it more, you realize they're relative. And if you don't realize that, you get into paradoxes, right? So, like big, it, you know, it doesn't. It's not obviously a relative term. Um, but then, if I say like. Here I am down here. All right. <laughs> that was one of my worst pictures ever. <laughs> Here's me. I'm looking at this tree and I'm like, whoa, that's a big tree. And then, meanwhile, over here, there's a mountain. And I'm like, well, you know, here's the other mountain. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's a small mountain. But if this is big and this is small, how come this is bigger than this? 
right? It's like a paradox. <laughs> How could that be? And, and, the, and the reason is that big is like had a hidden relativity, right? Like a tacit relativity, which um, we don't usually have, we don't usually fill in explicitly, but it's, it's always understood from context or something like that, you know, except in some situation where it, where it might really turn out to be ambiguous and then we would have to clarify or else we would get in trouble. You know, so we say this tree is big, we mean it's big relative to other trees, right? So the trees we have around here or something like that. When I say this mountain is small, I mean it's, oh, am I off the board that can be seen? There's the tree, there's the mountain. For those who are watching the recording, all right. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so um, yeah, we say this tree is big, we mean it's big relative to the trees we have around here. We say the mountain is small, we mean it's small relative to the mountains we have around here. So, um, so you know, in the case of big, it's pretty clear, but I guess I should write more relative to the here, as you can see. So there's some words like big where, although, you know, the appearance is uh, that it's absolute, you don't have to think about it that hard. I mean, the sophists in ancient Greek could get you in trouble with stuff like that, right? But, but still, you don't have to think about it that hard to realize it's a hidden relation. But then there's other terms like good, where it's really controversial whether there's a hidden relation or not, and if so, to what? Right, so like what Locke is saying about good, generally speaking, is that it's relative to the speaker or thinker, right? Like when I say it's good, and I mean, Locke, Locke is just following Hobbes on this. It's, um, nothing really surprising, uh, but you know, when I, when I say it's good without any qualification or, uh, without any special context, I mean it's good, as we would say, good for me, <laughs> right? Um, um, or, or I guess put it this way, like this good ha really has to be filled in with for, usually when I say it, it's understood that I mean for me. If I mean for someone else, I have to say it. This is good for them, meaning it it's pleasurable or useful for them. Right, so, um, but morally good. So this also has a hidden relation, according to law. And the relation is to the law, or I guess maybe to the lawmaker, depending on how you look at it. Right, so like if I ask whether, um, um, this, this looks like it says cause, it says law. <laughs> if I ask whether, uh, you know, walking in this direction is morally good, then just as, like, when I say this book is bigger, you could say that's bigger than what? If I ask, is this action morally good, you should ask relative to what law? Right, because there can be different lawmakers and they can have laws that contradict each other. And what gets your reward from one lawmaker might get you a punishment from another lawmaker. So you have to settle which law that we're talking about before you can answer the question. Um, so, um, and in fact, when Locke talks about, uh, so there's going to be three laws to talk about. The law of virtue, civil law, and the divine law, or which he also calls the law of reason or the law of nature. So when Locke talks about the law of virtue, um, 
he um, his whole discussion of the law of virtue is basically a defense of the type of moral relativism that's probably most familiar to us, cultural moral relativism. Right? Like the law of virtue it turns out to be relative to like what people in your society actually approve of or disapprove of. And then Locke gives all the kinds of examples that cultural moral relativists will give of how different that can be in different places. And, you know, um, and if you say that's morally good, um, when you're talking about the law of virtue, then you have to not only say, I'm talking about the law of virtue, but you have to say the law of virtue in which culture, society. Um, so, um, he, and he also understands the ancient ethics of virtue. Right, like what's now often called virtue ethics. He understands it as being about this. So he says, like when Cicero or Aristotle is asking what is morally good, that is, what is virtuous, they're asking what do people around here approve of. Um, um, and that's the standard they're going to refer everything to. Now, I mean, it's probably more defensible in the case of Cicero than Aristotle. It's probably not defensible at all in the case of Plato, but maybe Locke is just thinking of Plato when he says that. Um, but, okay, so, um, so, so far, Locke is, uh, you know, um, Moral relativist of a familiar kind, familiar contemporary kind. How does he get back out of this something like an absolute morality? Right? So, like the opposite of moral relativism, since absolute is the opposite of relativism, the opposite of moral relativism is moral absolutism. Right, which so that would so moral absolutism would say that morally good is an absolute or positive predicate, and you don't have to supply another relapse on to um, uh, I mean, sometimes it can be hard to think of examples like that that are clearer. <laughs> In fact, well, anyway, but um, but there's 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 things that are much closer to being like you know like. Um, is this chalk yellow? You don't really have to ask yellow relative to what? Well, maybe you do. Is there like yellow under what light? So, yeah, I don't know. But anyway, um, so uh, so how does Locke, Locke gets, nevertheless, although he's a moral relativist, and as I said, that's why this whole discussion is in a chapter about relations, because according to him, moral goodness is, is inherently a relative predicate. Um, nevertheless, he manages to get something like moral absolutism out of it. How does he do it? Well, so... So if you have different lawgivers who contradict each other, and you want to know um, what is like really morally good, then you want to ask like which one is offering the bigger rewards or threatening the bigger punishments, and or I mean basically you want both. Um, which one is going to be more accurate? and reliable in supplying the reward. Um, so, um, right, like, so for example, Locke says that, um, so 
Right, the, the law of virtue. The law of virtue is the law that's established by what your associates approve and disapprove of. And the reward and punishment is that they'll approve or disapprove of you. And Locke says, if you think that's a, a, you know, not a significant reward or punishment, you don't know much about human nature. <laughs> right? In fact, he says, people usually follow this. This is the this is what they're least likely to offend against. Whereas the civil law, as I think should be clear from what it's called, is the law that's established by the state that you live in, right? So and the rewards and punishments are, you know, usual criminal punishments. And there aren't as many rewards, but anyway, some kind of rewards. And uh um um, Locke says that people often will disregard this. So, like, for example, if there's a law against dueling, I think this, I guess this was the case in England at the time. Anyway, it was the case in many places at the time and afterwards that dueling was officially illegal and even a capital offense, right? But um, nevertheless, the law of virtue at least if you had a certain kind of associates. And this this can be relative, not just to the big society, but to who your club, as Locke calls it, right? Like the people you, um, the people whose approval and disapproval matters to you, basically, right? So if you have the right kind of associates, then, you know, like refusing to shoot to duel after a legitimate challenge would be very, very highly disapproved of. So Locke says, you know, people know that the state has the ability to uh, impose a very harsh punishment, the capital offense. But they flatter themselves that they won't get caught. Right? Like they know that the state often doesn't know when people violate its laws. Right? Whereas they're sure that everyone who knows them will find out if they if they decline the duel. Right? So they're going to obey this law, not this law, even though this law has a stronger punishment. Okay, but suppose you have a lawmaker who not only can um, uh, promise a greater punish, a greater reward than anyone else. Oh yeah, question. I was going to ask: Is this like it's something outside of people that's the law, or is there something within them, their minds, that's determining them uh, for or against an action as according to like this law? Well, the law itself is is outside of them, right? There's a lawmaker. I mean, in this case, the law nature is like spread out, right? But there's still, there's a law maker and it's not them. It's not up to them what the law is going to be. Now, I mean, obviously they have to know what the law is and form, you know, so that's something that has to be inside of them. But the law itself is, is outside. Yeah. Oh. Um, um, I mean, uh, one of the differences between the essay and the second treatise on government is that the second treatise on government, it seems like the person who's going to enforce the divine law or the law of nature is um, like doesn't appeal. Well, it does talk about appeal to heaven, meaning by the, <laughs> but. But, but for the most part, it seems like the executive is going to be like everyone. So but in that sense, if you think of the law that way, then you could say everyone has it within them, right? And that leads to Rousseau and Kant and whatever. But in, in this book, the lawmaker of the law of reason or law of nature is God. Is that, and God is something outside of them. I appreciate the answer. <laughs> well, you, you don't like the answer, or you can. Oh, I appreciate it. Uh, I guess I wanted to, to add up like 
I was trying to do like a like a thing where it's like if someone were to delude themselves into thinking that there was some law, um, would we be able to determine how does that affect the determination of if they're actually following the law? Like there's a law of virtue where they think everyone would would assume this about them if they did that, but as it turns out, maybe that's not actually true. Well, um, so like these lawmakers, um, for the most part, hold that ignorance of the law is no excuse. And I think, you know, Locke, uh, in talking about a slightly different question, but a related question, like about, he says, why, I don't know if this is still true, but apparently, at least then it was true, that you're liable for damages you do when you're sleepwalking. Right? So he says, why is that if it wasn't voluntary or whatever? And he says, well, it's because the, you know, the court can't tell whether you were really asleep or not. <laughs> so we have to punish it as if you were awake. Right, so it's like, um, so, so I mean, for these, that situation would usually, I mean, there can be exceptions for someone who's declared insane or whatever, right? But usually, the, you know, if you say, I was deluded as to what the law was, people will say, oh, sure you were, right? <laughs> this lawmaker, of course, they, you know, uh, Knows the kidneys and the heart <laughs> in the Bible. Uh, that, that doesn't translate. Kidneys part doesn't translate that well. But anyway, right. So, like this lawmaker, of course, knows what he really intended and, and may take that into account. I, I, I mean, I don't think Locke says enough here to know exactly what he says about that. Um, um, but that would still be a case of being wrong about what the law is. The law really still is whatever it is. All right. Um, right. So anyway, I mean, I kind of like gave away the punchline already, but right. So the, the lawmaker who has infinite ability to reward and punish and is infinitely accurate. Um, that's going to be the law. That's the law that would be good for you to follow <laughs> if you really paid attention. So if you really pay attention, you will follow, right? Because of psychological hedonism. If you really pay, if you really believe that there's such a lawmaker, um, and you really like keep that in mind, then you will follow that law. And that's the point of making the law. <laughs> Right, as you know, as Locke says, um, this is. Um, well, I, I think what I read before was section five. I might have said it was section six. This is section six. For since it would be utterly in vain to suppose a rule set to the free actions of man without annexing to it some enforcement of good and evil to determine his will. We must, wherever we suppose a law, suppose also some reward and punishment annexed to that law. Right? The point of a law is to that I'm trying to get someone to do something because of the law. Different than what they would have done if there were no law. But they're always going to do what they think will procure pleasure and avoid pain. So the only way to accomplish that is to um, to att attach some new pleasure and pain to the law to enforce it. Right? And Locke says it has to be new. It can't be just a natural consequence of breaking the law. This, you know, especially when it comes to the divine law, this, you know, this is going to divide Locke from Leibniz, for example. Right, like Leibniz says, all punishments, um, all divine punishments are natural consequences of whatever it was he did. Um, Hobbes says that too, although I think when Hobbes says it, he means that uh, 
there isn't really God and divine law is just like what you what would make sense for you to do. <laughs> right. But anyway, so what Locke says, you know, if it was a natural consequence of the action, then sure you're gonna do it, but not because of the law. You would have done it anyway. Right, so the law is pointless. So if the law is supposed to make you do it because of the law, then it has to have a word of punishment attached to it. Um, and to um, to get an absolute law that everyone should follow, then you need um, a law maker who is infinitely powerful and accurate in Locke's sense of infinite. Right, like you don't have to know that they can give you a reward that's actually infinite in quantity. That doesn't even really make sense, I think, according to lot. You just have to know that whatever reward someone else offers, they can offer more. <laughs> um, Okay, so um, right, and this is what he's talking about. This is on page seventy-seven. The truth. So actually, this is book one, chapter three, section six. The true ground of morality, which can only be the will and law of a God who sees men in the dark, has in his hands rewards and punishments, and power enough to call to account the proudest offender. Right. So morality requires that. This, you know, um, this means that Locke, in a certain sense, is very close to Kant. Like the, the role of Locke's God in morality is close, or the role of Kant's God in morality is closer to Locke's God than to Leibniz's, for example. I mean, it's just kind of turned around backwards, but otherwise it's the same. <laughs> all right. So, but all right. So, what is the divine law? How do we know what the divine law is? So obviously, this is going to be really important. In fact, this is the most important question you could ask, according to this. Um, so, um, so first of all, um, if this like absolute morality is going to have any um, like universal applicability. It has to be something that people can figure out with their own reason. I mean, that means two things, actually. First of all, it means they have to be able to figure out that God exists using their own reason. Right? And then you have then they have to be able to figure out what law God would command using their own reason. If it depends, if it depended on what was said in some book, then like the, um, then I guess this has something to do with what you're asking before, like the laws have to be promulgated, right? Um, you know, so like if it depended on what was said in some book, then people who never heard of that book, like the law would never have been published to them. So like it couldn't be justly enforced again. Um, so it wouldn't really apply to them. So that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for like an absolute answer to the question of what's morally good. Um, so, okay. So, I mean, that tells us something about, that still doesn't tell us the context. What is it? How can we figure out using our reason what this law is? So the answer, what can I write this? Give me some commands. So the answer, and this is gonna, um,
this is going to bring up something that we'll see again in Hume, and it's almost the same in Hume, but it's on the other hand really different. The answer is that the divine law com commands what has public utility. Um, at least that's how I understand what Locke is saying. Uh, so that is the divine law um, commands people to do what's good for the public. Now, like, who is the public? It, it seems like, according to Locke, and this much would be um, completely consistent with what he says in the second treatise, the public is all rational beings. Although, again, it may be hard to pay attention to all those ones that are very far away and you don't know about them and so forth. But that's really what this means. It has to be, it's limited to rational beings because basically it's limited to beings that, which can understand a lot. That's the, um, that's the definition of, rat, of rational in this context. Like beings who can understand the obligation that there is in a law. Um, it's all those people you're seeking the good of. People or whatever. Right? I mean, if they're rational parents, then it includes rational parents. Um, I think that's right. In this book, he's not completely clear about it. But I but I, I think that's what he's he's thinking. So um, um, so I think that's what he means when you look in. Uh, should be closing this book. I think we're going to the same place. Three seventeen. Um, right, so this is book two, chapter 28, section eight, section eight. That God has given a rule whereby men should govern themselves. I think there is nobody so brutish as to deny it. So, by the way, he is going to give his proof of the existence of God. That's the, that's in book four, right? So we haven't got to that yet. Um, he has goodness and wisdom to direct our actions to that which is best. And then he goes on, he has power to enforce it, etc. But it, I'm, I'm asking about that first part. What does that mean? He has goodness and wisdom to direct our actions to that which is best. So first of all, like the goodness of God, like it can't be this, right? I mean, there's no lawmaker that can promise rewards or threaten punishments to God. It must be this kind of goodness. Good, right? God is like uh, or is good for for whom? Well, God is good for everything. <laughs> That's the goodness of God. And um, and so when he says uh, uh, he has goodness and wisdom to direct our actions to that which is best, now in what, what sense do we mean best? So again, we can't mean this because we're talking about why God would make a law to begin with. Right? It's like based on his wisdom or wisdom or their wisdom or whatever pronoun we should use for God. Um, if we're Spinoza, we would use it. <laughs> right. So, anyway, so like based on God's wisdom. Um, God is going to choose a law to direct our actions to that which is best. So the best here has to has to come before the law, right? And so I think again, the best is from that sense of good.
right? And that's what we're supposed to be able to prove about God. I mean, we'll see that, uh, I don't know if I get a chance to talk about this much or not, but um, when we when we get to, to Locke's proof of the existence of God, it's not clear how he can get to this moral attributes. Um, but, um, but anyway, what we're supposed to be able to prove is that God wants what's best for everyone. And since God wants what's best for everyone, but we don't tend to do what's best for others because we tend to do what's best for ourselves. That's why God would attach rewards and punishments. Yeah. Isn't that in a way stripping people of free will? If he's creating those laws where you strive to do what is good and you do do what is good according to him, so you're just doing what God told you to do all the time? Well, remember, Locke says we don't have free will, right? So yes, it's stripping people of free will. I mean, that is, they're free, right? Like whether they follow the law or not depends on whether they prefer to or not. If they're not, if they're not free, right? Like if if someone throws me off a cliff and I fall on someone and kill them, that's not murder, right? So because in that case, I wasn't free. So, like the, the the people who are being promised rewards or threatened with punishments are free to do it or not, but um, that just means they'll do it if they prefer to do it, and they won't if they prefer not to do it. What determines whether they prefer to do it or not? Pleasure and pain. So this law, like every law, uses pleasure and pain to get people to to do what the lawmaker wants. Well, in this case, what the lawmaker wants is what's best for everyone. And so, like, so this is the situation, right? Like, um, if there were no law, um, it, you know, I see you eating an apple, and I want that apple, and you will get me pleasure. Well, maybe you didn't start eating it yet. That's kind of gross. But anyway, <laughs> I see you with an apple, and I know that that apple will get me pleasure. And so, um, um, or I have unease because I don't have it. And so what am I going to do? I'm going to go take it. Because that's best for me. Because it will give me pleasure. Now, like I said, that, you know, that's kind of assuming that there's no one else around us, right? In the second treatise, I think Locke's idea is that if everyone sees me doing that, they're going to be upset. But, but he doesn't go into that here. So like leave, leave that aside. What I'm going to do is get the apple for me. That's what's best. And so, um, but, uh, but suppose, I mean, maybe it's not that clear. Suppose it's not best for everyone if like no one can be sure of their apples because someone's going to come and take it, <laughs> right? So um, so God has sufficient wisdom to see it's not best for everyone if everyone, you know, anyone can just come take your apple whenever they want to. And so to balance out that pleasure I would get from taking your apple, God is going to attach a punishment. And of course, God's punishment is going to be worse. It's going to outweigh the pleasure I got from that. So if I pay attention... And moreover, you see, I don't have to ask God about this. Because again, if I had to ask God, meaning, what does that mean? We will see something Locke says about, about prophecy when we get to book four, and we'll see that it's not very useful, <laughs> according to Locke. Right? But, you know, but like, anyway, like, it probably means I have to ask someone who claims to represent God or something like that. Um, Sorry. Um, so, um, so, but anyway, like, I don't have to do that. All I have to do is use my reason to figure out what would be best for everyone. I mean, if it, if I hadn't proved that there were a lawmaker like this, I would just use my reason to figure out what was best for me. But now I know there's this lawmaker who wants what's best for everyone and sees men in the dark, and has rewards and punishments in their hand, et cetera, et cetera. And so I switch, and I start, if I'm paying attention, if I'm focusing, 
I switch and I start using my reason to figure out what's best for everyone. And of course, if everyone does that, that will be good for everyone. And so um, that's what God wanted, and that's why I make a um, um, And again, like the tricky point here is that, um, like, because you might think this violates the rule that it shouldn't, but it shouldn't be a natural consequence. The reward shouldn't be a natural consequence. Um, because, like, it is a natural consequence of my act that everyone is better off. That's what I figure out, right? That's how I decide to do it. Um, but it's not a natural consequence of the act that I will be better off. Right? So it's like this um, supernatural, no, I should say this. But anyway, it's this, it, it's this not natural, but rather moral connection between my act and the reward. That's what aligns my will to the, to the universal will. Um, and like I said, the role of God in, in Kant is actually close to this. Just, um, just starts the other way around. So anyway, um, all right. The other thing, oh boy, I don't know if I'm going to get that madness. What happens <laughs> Um, well, I just want to, I mean, I think I already said most of what needs to be said about this, but I just wanted to go back to personal identity. Oh, no, that's not that, that part of the word. Uh, so, um, Right, so, so Locke says person is a forensic term that is a legal term, as opposed to what he calls man, but we, we, we would probably say human being, right? He says human being is a biological term like oak. He doesn't use the word biological. I don't know if that exists. Anymore. But, you know, like, if we want to know... Yeah, this is the time direction, right? If you want to know, is this the same human being as the, just like with the oak, we ask whether they're connected by the right, like, light process. So even though this doesn't contain the same matter as this, it's connected in the right way. Like the matter, you know, came in and went out in the right way, and it's all, it seems to be the same organism. So, like, Human identity would be about that. But Locke says person is not about that. Person is a moral, legal uh, term. So, I mean, this is why, like, we ask is a corporation a person? Um, I mean, if you were to ask is a corporation a human being, the answer would be obviously no. But if you ask, is a corporation a person, then as Locke is understanding that term, um, that means something like, is the corporation responsible for its actions? Can it be rewarded and punished? Right? And then the answer would be, well, yeah, that's the whole point of a corporation. <laughs> I mean, uh, that, um, or at least, I mean, we certainly want corporations to be persons in that sense, right? We want them to be liable for punishment for what the previous state of the corporation did. Um, I mean, obviously, like there's other issues about, you know, whether the corporation should have free speech to be able to make campaign corporate. You know, that's not what Locke is talking about, but just like the basic meaning of the word person, that's what he's talking about. So there, you know, there can be artificial persons. He's not really interested in that here. Hobbes is very interested in that. That's most of Hobbes' discussion of person. 
but no, so he's talking about human persons, but he says like, so the same person, if I ask, is this the same person as this? What I mean is, um, is this is this person liable to be punished for something this person did? Or deserve a war for something this person did? Um, and, you know, obviously this is an important question, right? Like, because, um, we want to, or I mean, and, and, and this is how it's going to work out. We want this person's actions to be influenced by what's going to happen to this. So when we choose the one that's going to be responsible for this one's actions, we're trying to choose the one that this person wants to procure pleasure and avoid pain for. Um, so that's the basic question. Right, with a certain, like a corporation doesn't have a will like that. And we try to, the like charter of the corporation is supposed to substitute for that somehow. It doesn't always work that well. <laughs> right, but anyway, so like, um, so the question is which, person in the future, do I want to have pleasure and avoid pain? And Locke says, so, I mean, first of all, there should be, there better be a unique answer to that. There isn't a unique answer. If there's two people like that, then this relation is like not Identity, right? Like identity is supposed to be transit, as we would say, right? Like if this is identical to this and this is identical to this, then these two should be the same, but they're not, <laughs> right? So I mean, how Locke thinks that's guaranteed, I'm not sure. He does think about some kind of science fiction possibilities, right? Like he discusses a case where my little finger is cut off and my consciousness goes with the little finger rather than with the rest of my body. <laughs> so it seems like a small step from that to ask, what if my consciousness continued with both? But he doesn't. I mean, that's mm -hmm. the kind of thing that like modern metaphysicians spend a lot of time worrying about. But, so as far as I, I don't know if it just didn't occur to him or if you think something will prevent it. But in any case, assume there's just one of them, which one is it? And Locke says, and I'm not sure I understand exactly what the proof of this is or why we should think this, but Locke says, it's the one who's going to remember being me, or at least who could remember being me. I think it's important to add that qualification because as Locke says, most of the time we don't remember most of the things that happened to us in the past. Um, but the case Locke talks about where, so where even though it's the same human being, it's become a new person, is a case where, so suppose that life process continued from here to there. But meanwhile, something happens so that this one can't and never will be able to remember anything that happened before this event. So Locke says, this is the same human being, but this is one person and this is a different person. Um, this one doesn't care what will happen to that one. And so it's not fair that it's not effective to punish this one for something this one did. And on the other hand, this is like theologically useful. He says, Suppose, you know, this is time, this is time zillion. This is the last day. The day of judgment. Right? So, like, suppose that 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 at this time this human being dies. There's no life process that continues past this. 
Now, suppose at this time, a new human being rises out of the ground. So Locke says, these aren't the same human beings. Or he puts it, not the same man, right? But he says, if this one can remember what this one did, they are the same person. Now, like I said, the thing about remember, the weird thing is it seems to go the wrong direction, right? Like it seems like you should ask which one I anticipate being or something, not which one will remember me. And but it has something to do with what he's saying about consciousness, about it being the same consciousness. And like I said, I'm not sure I understand that. And I don't have time to talk about it, but will I do understand? Um, so, but that's the that's the basic idea about personal identity. And as you can see, it fits together with the rest of the system, right? I mean, um, this and this is why Locke says that um, the question, questions about like whether the soul is an immaterial substance or whatever are perhaps interesting metaphysical questions, but they're not ethically, religiously, politically relevant. Right, it doesn't matter if there's some immaterial thing that still existed after this human being died and it kept going all the way to death. Maybe there is, maybe there isn't. But it doesn't matter. What matters is just that this human being remembered being this. So it could be that the mind is just a mode of material thing. Right? And it's, you know, like, um, the brain produces thought, like the liver produces bile. Who, who was it who said that? That's like a famous quote. My response to it always is, I wish the brain were that reliable. <laughs> but in any case, uh, uh, right, so that means that when this life, if that's true, then when this life process ends, um, you know, uh, there is no mind in it. Yeah. When you say remember, so like the first, the second person must remember this, the first person. Is that because of like kind of divine, like divine law? Like they both, they both must have like the same consistent sense of divine law in order to be like one. I mean, I think it would be true for any law, actually, for a law. I mean, again, there's problems determining it for human law. Right? Right, but like Locke says, in fact, that's why, you know, um, um, if someone did something when they were insane, they're not liable for the damages because they weren't the same person. Actually, maybe that's not the best example. Uh, but I think he's left out maybe yeah, so I mean, the problem, as Locke says, the problem is that, like, it may, yeah, I mean, maybe we could do that better now than they could then, but the problem is it may be difficult to determine whether you're really blacked out or whether you're just pretending to black out, right? So, uh, like, God knows stuff like that that these human lawmakers may not. Um, but yeah, I think Locke is saying, in principle, this, this is what you want. You want the person you're punishing to remember being the person who did the act. And again, it's because like the way memory works according to him is pretty strong. Like I actually am conscious that I had that past idea. It's I I think um, it's not supposed to be like an inference. Um, but like, but I don't. But I'm still not sure exactly how that. Translates the backward direction into the forward direction. That's what I was trying to say. Um, that also probably means I'm out of time. Yeah. Um, okay. I didn't get to talk about madness. Maybe I will talk about it next time. But I have to start book three. Well, I don't know. We'll see. Anyway, I'll see you then. Probably.